Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, should be an interesting talk. I'm here to talk about uh, a common problem that I think uh, us at Datastax have, uh, have been de dealing with for the past uh, few, few years. Um, and this is probably something a lot of people who are trying to build a Cassandra platform for their business um, is, is probably also uh, seeing as well. Uh, my name is Jake. I'm a uh, lead developer at D Datastax. I've been uh, working on Cassandra for many years um, since it came out. And um, this is sort of a evolution that we took internally. Um, and I think it serves as a good example of a different way of thinking about Cassandra and potentially how Cassandra serves as a great bedrock for building a effective database as a service. Um, now, this is specifically about Cassandra. I think the core premise of this idea is Cassandra were, Cassandra is built with the idea that you know, it does everything itself. It doesn't rely on anything except for like TCP IP and like the kernel. That's it. Everything, everything else it does itself. Um, whereas we took the idea of, you know, there's this new modern world of, uh, you know, of, of cloud computing uh, uh, infrastructure as a service, Kubernetes operators, object storage. How can we rethink Cassandra um, in this world? And how can we simplify some of the issues? So, this is probably the most, you know, controversial slide. Cassandra is awesome, right? We've, I mean, I've built my uh, career on it, and it's fantastic. A, a lot of the talks you saw today were about our, you know, compaction strategies, our our uh, our uh, tri-based tri tri mem tables, our our SS tables. All these nifty, really low-level engineering bits that we've used to make Cassandra the most scalable thing, um, and it's and it's built and proven by uh, many large organizations, lots of users all around the world. The problem is, at least that we've found, is that um, you know trying trying to operate it in production can be difficult, and this is something that you know it's it's getting better over time. But us, you know, running uh, Datastax Astra had felt this pain in a, in a, in a specific way, right? And, and I think part of the reason why it's hard to operate is because of the things that used to make it easy to operate, if that makes any sense. Back in the day, you know, before, before the cloud, before Kubernetes, before all these things, um, you know, uh, running Cassandra on your own, just uh, setting up your seed nodes, um, and having fixed IPs and everything just worked, it was nice. Um, and the problem is over the years, as the platform has gotten bigger and there's, there's uh, been you know, more features added, more things added, it's kind of um, some of the design choices in, in, on the Dynamo side have actually made it um, a bit difficult. This is actually something, if you went to the talk uh, earlier, uh, from from uh, a, 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 a Alex Petrov, he was talking about how you know we're trying to fix the uh, the con cons consistency problem of of our um, of our topology metadata. Um, so this is like a common problem that people have, and and to me, I just wanted to break down that. I, uh, some of the insights we've had is that you know since all nodes since it's leaderless it's you know all, all nodes are the same they they all do everything is actually a crutch in this world because you know you, you can't your your CPU and and your memory and your disk all have to scale at, at the same amount um, so you end up wasting money because you know oh well my my you know uh, I three four x large um, Machines all get this this amount of disk and this much memory, and you know I have a disk problem, so I have to add more nodes. But my qu queries per second is relatively low, so you end up in this weird world where the fact that you can't break things up makes it um, uh, uh, hard. The other thing is you know uh, 
let's see. Um, yeah, I think the last point is a good one too. This is something I've seen a lot is that, you know, a lot of Cassandra clusters out there are running at, you know, max, max scale because they can't handle uh, sc scaling up and then scaling back down. So um, uh, EE elasticity is, is, is a problem in the sense that, you know, you have to run at kind of your, your peak uh, because if you run anything less than your peak, you can't respond to a peak. Um, so this is kind of the world that we started in. This is like, you know, Cassandra as a service circa 2019. You know, let's just run Cassandra clusters on K Kubernetes. So where a lot of people are, this is what Cassandra does. Um, and what we tried to do is build, you know, uh, 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 K K K Kubernetes operators, which automate some of the, the operational burden. It tries to deal with the uh, impetus mismatch between uh, Kubernetes and Cassandra, specifically like seed nodes and uh, IPs ch changing and, uh, you know, uh, uh, attached disks uh, 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 res reservations of, of attached disks being to assigned to specific nodes, which get restarted, <clears throat> all that stuff. Now, what ends up happening is um, we've just kind of, we're just kind of going with, with, the, with the basic approach of, you know, we're running Cassandra in the cloud, it's on Kubernetes, but it's not using Kubernetes in the way that it was meant to be used. It's kind of, you know, we're, 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 we're taking an apple and we're putting it into a cake and we're calling it an apple cake and it's not, you want an apple pie, you know, it's not like, it wasn't thought of from the ground up. So the idea, <laughs> that's a terrible analogy, but, but that's, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what, what, what would an ideal database as a service look like? This is the problem we had. The other problem we had is, you know, if you're paying for this, um, you're, you're running into the same problem as, as running a Cassandra cluster yourself, where, you know, the minimum cost of running this is like, you know, $1,500 a month in terms of uh, instances. Um, so it's, it's difficult to attract people to come and use this platform because the threshold to start is very high. <clears throat> so what would an ideal database as service look like? Um, you know, cheap. That's kind of the most important thing. You want, you know, you just want to pay for what you use. You want it to actually be elastic. You want it to um, fulfill the promise of being able to scale up and scale down. Um, you want it to be uh, integrated into that cloud ecosystem. Um, you want it to be secure. Um, you want it to be uh, re uh, reliable by building on things which are proven, rather than b building them yourself and waiting, you know, however many years for them to stabilize. And you know, you want it to be simple from an operational and development standpoint. We wanted to build things that we could, we, instead of having someone join and having to learn all of everything, they could kind of focus on one individual piece. Um, <clears throat> so as an aside, we started looking at like, okay, well, how does, this is in 2020, how does, you know, these cloud, how do these cloud databases work, right? Um, they, they're kind of, they automatically scale based on load. They, uh, you only pay for what you're using. They're deeply rooted in cloud architecture, um, and they're built, they're built sympathetically to that end uh, to, to basically make it leverageable to provide a better service. Um, and a great example is the, um, uh, the, the uh, Aurora system, um, which is built, if you read that paper, it's, it's very informative in how you can build a, a cloud-based um, database. The problem was at the time, other than papers, there really wasn't anything out there. This is back in 2020, the only cloud databases, serverless cloud databases that really existed were, you know, were, were Amazon, Microsoft, Google. There was one, uh, uh, FaunaDB, which came out of the t Twitter engineering spinoff. Um, but other than that, it was kind of like, well, how can we build it ourselves? So that's kind of what we set out to do. We, we decided, Let's use Cassandra as a shared li library. Let's not use Cassandra as is. Let's use the parts of it that work really well for what they are, and let's use the bits of the cloud and, uh, and, and Kubernetes that uh, that work work really well um, in, in the cases where the, the where the Cassandra bits 
don't, don't necessarily fit. So the first choice is, you know, the first choice we made was let's, let's stop using attached disk. Let's, let's make the source of truth for disk S3. So when we, when, when, when we flush data from a mem table, um, let's write it to S3 instead of the local disk. Or let's do both. And, and we'll treat, treat the sor source of truth as, uh, as the S3 bucket. Um, and if you went to the uh, talk er er earlier about uh, con consistent cluster metadata, this should be a no-brainer. It's like, we're already running in Kubernetes. We're already built on etcd. We're dependent on etcd availability. Let's use etcd for our, 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 our cluster metadata. So a lot of the same tricks that um, is, is coming out of 5.0, we've been already doing, like uh, con consistent schema changes, consistent topology changes. And I think I put the wrong CEP. It should be CEP21. Uh, but this all fits into exactly what CEP21 is doing. We're just, instead of building it from scratch in Java, we're building it you know, on top of something that's already working. Um, and the other idea is let's smash the monolith, Hulk smash, and break it into its uh, constituent pieces. Um, and combine all these things together to build a very cloud sympathetic service. So this is kind of the logical description of what I just came out of my mouth. Um, we have our you know, object storage at the bottom split across um, multiple availability zones. We have the physical uh, underlying nodes which are running. We have Lambda services, um, which, for example, uh, Compaction is now running as a separate service rather than running in the same JVM, and that can scale on its own. We're using uh, etcd as our metadata tier. Um, we, we, we have our data tier, which holds the, the disk, and we have our coordination tier. Um, so this is kind of a, a more, I guess, uh, physical mapping of what things look like. Um, now, obviously, I'm not going to get through all the details of what this is here, but I'm trying to paint a picture, and I can go into specifics as questions come up. I'm trying to leave as much time at the end. But, um, but for example, our source of truth, again, is, is S3. Um, so we still use fast disk, right? You can't just fetch data off of S3 and expect it to be fast. But one of the insights is, you know, you, you can get really, uh, really uh, the relative cost of, of, of NVMe disks on, on, uh, on, on, on nodes which have ephemeral disk um, is way less expensive than attached disk uh, for, for, for the same number of IOPS. Um, and those come for, for free with the node. Uh, so it, it was kind of ideal in the sense that we could basically just build um, a, a file system caching layer which uh, you know, if, if there was a miss on the local disk, it would just go 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 to S3. Um, this gives us a huge amount of benefits. Where like when when you flush things to to S3, for example, uh, then an etcd is our metadata service. That s that ss table gets gets posted there, and and our compactors go, oh look, a new ss table. Uh, I'm I'm going to go and compact that data, um, and, and put it back in to S3, um, which notifies the, the etcd update which the node that owns that SS table will then go, you know, fetch that SS table. So it kind of created this, you know, cloudy system. And actually, it turns out if, if you look at today, you know, this is like the new hot thing. This is like what everyone's doing. We didn't really talk about it too much, but this is something that, you know, ha has been proven in production. This is what runs Astra. Um, so we have our, 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 um, our, uh, our coordination tier. We have our data tier. We have our metadata tier, and we have a bunch of auxiliary services off, off the end. Um, and this is sort of an example plot of like our scaling, right? This is when we, when we were sort of initially launching. This is just scaling our, our like just the clients, you know, uh, th is, is in the orange. And this is like uh, actually scaling up the, the nodes, which source the data from, from S3. Uh, to, uh, to be able, you could see within you know, uh, a few, few few seconds, you're able to two x your your throughput. And the nice thing is that you can actually scale, scale it back down. Um, now, the benefits of this design, as a summary of all the different things, right? Um, we, we basically get uh, our our topology and schema changes are now consistent. Um, our, we have components that that can scale independently, like our compaction can can, can scale. Uh, 
separately from our reads and writes. Uh, we have um, all pods have access to all data. This means you don't have to stream data anymore from node to node. Whenever you're like trying to scale up your your, 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 your Cassandra cluster and you try to bootstrap a new node, it actually makes your current workload worse because it has to stream all the data out. All that's gone. Um, we, uh, we, 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 we now have the, the, the option to build a, uh, we now have this tiered uh, storage layer, which I mentioned, and, and the interesting you know, computer science problem we have is like how do we most efficiently pre-cache the data on the disk um, so that we have as few misses as possible. Now, we, we have a bunch of different strategies for this, and this is an area that's like sort of the fun exploratory cloud-based solutions that we get to focus on the hard engineering problem of how do we track what data is being read and write to, to optimally pre-cache the right amount of data onto disk versus always having all the data on the disk. So this means for a workload that has, for example, a very, you know, um, a time series type workload, we are really only looking at the past day or two of data um, you can actually have on S3 like a petabyte of, of, of data sitting there, but it's not actually being read from. But it's still accessible if you really want to. So it kind of gives us a, a nice you know, benefit of both. Um, the other nice thing is you know, we, we, we don't have the attached disk problem of Kubernetes, which is kind of, Kubernetes was built with like API services and you know, uh, sta stateless services in mind and not you know, a durable, consistent, um, stateful database. Um, this kind of solves that problem, and, it, and that's why we call it uh, a, a serverless database, because there's no individual piece of, of, of infrastructure that has to be there. Um, all, all, all the pieces can fall apart, we can bring the whole thing back. Um, to, uh, to, to, that, to that end, we can fully recover um, our, 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 um, our topology and scale up and scale down quickly. Um, the other nice thing about using S3 is a backup then just becomes the manifest of what SS tables are live at any given set of, uh, at any given time. Um, so, uh, you, so we don't actually have to do like a backup where we move a bunch of data around. It's already backed up uh, nine times in S3. Um, and you know, the, the value here of, of the, the integration and security is you know, it, it, it's just an S3 bucket uh, every database has its own S S3 bucket, which, uh, which belongs to it. Um, we could potentially you know, make that an S3 bucket that you give to us. So like, we don't even touch your data. It's your bucket in, it's your data in your bucket. We, 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 uh, we just support reads and writes to it. <clears throat> now the last bit is probably the most interesting bit. Um, and this is where, so all that's great, right? But it's still, you're running a bunch of hardware for a particular database. But the, the real holy grail is like, could you come up with a, um, with a multi-tenant data platform? Where rather, and we did by changing the concept of like a ring in Cassandra is a node level construct. And we decided to make it a key space level construct. This means that a given set of nodes in, um, in our production fleet in a particular region um, can, can be uh, part of a ring of one or more databases. Um, now, since the data is isolated per key space and per bucket, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 it's not like you can access someone else's data because the tokens don't match in the first place, but also you know, they're, uh, they're already separated and our auth is already integrated deeply into the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Cassandra roles-based system. Um, now, what's nice about this is is the ability to um, our ability to scale things, right? So we have this fleet of pods that are sitting there. You know, they, they all have a disk cache, they all have um, CPU, they all have memory, um, and we can we can dynamically um, move uh, the the, uh, the metadata and the tokens around to individual uh, pods. So that means if you have an active workload. Um, uh, you, you're, uh, you will end up on your own set of pods, uh, uh, isolated, and, and, and they can scale on their own. Uh, and then if you stop using it for a day, then it, it gets squashed back down in, into that smaller shared pool. So the problem then becomes for us, you know, how, how do we optimally um, uh, manage this fleet um, to optimize the, the 
uh, to, to make the resources as, as hi highly utilized as possible while maintaining a, 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 a good a SLA for everyone. Um, and that's where, you know, um, ha having the, the Kubernetes operators, the monitoring framework, um, and, and, and the ML logic involved to look at, like, wh what is the state of the cluster, which, which, um, which nodes are active, which ones aren't, which tenants are active, which ones aren't, and, and how should I optimally um, shuffle them into this group. So this is where, like, the real interesting cloud bits come from. Uh, and that's kind of it. Uh, I dumped I dumped a lot because I figured there's probably a lot and there's probably a bunch of questions. So I'm happy to go into you know details here. Um, uh, yeah, I have a microphone. Who wants to talk? Yes. Okay. So with the S3 storage. Uh, you know, if you were caching the data on one of the, you know, ephemeral disks on the server, it's going to be fast. But if a if there's a cache, a read, it's a cache miss, and it goes to S3, what's you know, what's the latency of like cache misses? Because it seems like cache hit ratio would be critical. Yeah. For, for your read SLAs, right? So what's like what would be the expected, you know, for cache misses, the latency on reads? Well, so the latency we see for fetching from S3 is in like the 10 to 20 millisecond range, which if you're reading from like five SS tables isn't great. So, um, but the, but this is where the, we have a bunch of different caching strategies. So folks who, you know, want to pay for really low uh, read latencies, we, we, we effectively pre-cache as much as we can um, in, in, in a gr 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 greedy fashion. Um, my, uh, my colleague here, Zhao, he just worked on a, um, a caching strategy which takes into account uh, time-based time -based access, the age of the SS table, plus the token range accesses of um, of of of, uh, of the SS tables to, uh, to um, and, and it generates a histogram once per minute or once per hour I forget what it is is it once per once per hour um, and so we use that data whenever a new node comes up to to um, more intelligently uh, cache it but but this is a cold start problem so solving the cold start problem is is tractable. And this is this is why you know for us we're we're just like hey if we don't know how to how to intelligently cache it we're just going to aggressively cache as much as we can, um, and over time you know in improving the our our intelligence of, of the caching so that our our users don't see the an SLA hit. So it's not like it's not like seconds you know it's still milliseconds. It's still fast. I mean, but it really comes down to like so it's so that caching logic is applied per table. So if you have like a table. That's like a bunch of log data that 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 uh, that you don't really care about or really read. Um, we we don't cache it. But if this is but if this is a table that you're actively using all the time, then like we're just going to cache more and more. Um, but there is sort of the cold start problem. In a lot of cloud databases, it's like you know you have to kind of run your your you have to pre warm your your workload. Like if you're expecting you know like a big job to run, then you're it's, you're better off like trying to pre uh, pre warm it it's so one of the things that I think with database as a service that we've seen where you know a lot of people who come from using databases like uh, like 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 uh, like Dynamo or whatever like in their docs they say if you want really good read latencies like pre pre warm your workload <laughs> um, so it's one of those things where um, but for people using uh, uh, going from like a five node, Cassandra cluster to this, it's it's th th there's a difference there, so that's one of the things that we're trying to find the right mix of like how aggressively do, do we pre-cache everything versus how intelligent can we be versus you know can we even separate disk and compute even more um, to build a more durable version of that disk cache that still isn't the source of truth but it's you know there all the time. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I was just wondering, how does uh, consistency levels and replication factor in all this now that you've moved everything to S3? Yeah, so we, we it's still Cassandra. Um, it's still R3. We split the racks across um, availability zones. This does mean that when you flush, you're flushing three copies, which then is flushed again three copies. But, the, but one of the beautiful properties of this is once you compact the data, you've actually repaired your data um, and you've, um, and you've de de duplicated it. Um, so, so only the recently flushed data is, is, um, is, is uh, multiple copied. But, but since the, the S3 bucket um, works across AZs, um, you're, you're, uh, the, you, you have much better consistency um, in terms of the, your, your, your database because you don't have nodes that like, oh, we haven't repaired this in a long time. The system's always getting um, all, all copies of, of the data pushed to it when it fetches from S3 new data. <coughs> Up here, oh, sorry. This is my boss. He's handing the microphone around. That's how I like it. <laughs> you know <who's> Faster. <laughs> Let's go. You know who's the real boss. Uh, so how big are the local disk cache? And you talked about pre-warming the data, but since they are ephemeral, there are chances that you, know, you can't predict when the, you might lose the disk and data, right? Uh, so how, how do you deal with those scenarios? And uh, and as, a, as they are local and ephemeral, do you detect when they're lost and then when new ones come and you uh, yes. cache data on it? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, so, so this is where the, the operator, the, uh, so, so the Kubernetes operator pattern, um, we have operators that manage this for us. So if a node goes down, one of the design decisions we made, which um, I think worked out well, is we don't have down nodes. We actually, um, Effectively, uh, uh, we remove the node from the cl cluster when it goes down, so, uh, uh, since it's ephemeral, um, and we bring up a brand new node that rejoins the cluster. Um, and, and, and since we're working with um, uh, uh, quorum-based systems, right? Like if a node goes down, it's fine. You're still achieving quorum. Um, so yeah, if the disk dies or the disk goes bad, we just kill the node. That's the nice thing about a serverless ephemeral system is there's no state that we can't recover. Um, even the data in etcd, um, I just, we describe it as sort of a, a transactional cache. So it, it's the transa transactional barrier of state changes, but we store the, the state itself back in S3. So even if we lose all of etcd, we just re rebuild the state from S3. Um, so it's like a fully self-sufficient um, ar architecture in that sense. Yes. Hi. Uh, do you do any kind of cache coherency across, across pods? And then if you do, what's the overhead for that? So the cache coherency, I mean, since it's Cassandra, we don't do cache coherency. We, the, 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 I guess I'm not sure what the question is. As in, like, if uh, you know you're maintaining these cache uh, caches which are in ephemeral disks, right? Yeah. So, uh, unless you're flushing everything down to S3 every time, and that you know, if if and that's the source of truth, then you don't have to worry about it. Right? Yeah, that's what we do. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. So, so our our transaction for a flush is you know flush the mem table to local disk and flush it to S3. If either of those fails, then the flush failed. So like we're, we're guaranteeing that the data is in S3 before we're done flushing. So you know we know we have a backed up copy of, of the SS table available for everyone. And that notification, the end of the transaction, is it, it updates in etcd the live SS table list. And it's like, hey, new SS table. And the nodes that own the ranges of that SS table will go, hey, there's a new SS table in my range. Let me go grab it. Um, <laughs> it grabs it back from S3. Now, this does mean that S3 needs to be consistent, which it is, across all three platforms. So mm -hmm. it's not like you get in a case where, you know, just because you wrote it in S3, it's not actually available somewhere else. That's something they fixed right around 2020, which was very helpful for us because we didn't have to, we didn't have to worry about that problem. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Is your Cassandra running 
you, you, you can say your binaries are run inside the worker node um, separately. Yeah, so, yeah, so this goes back to the shared library analogy. Yeah. I think that's the best way to think of it. We're actually running Cassandra 4.0, but we're using the bits of the class path and the classes that, that make sense. So our main, our main functions are like, you know, okay, start the compaction manager, um, you know, uh, uh, gr grab the metadata from, from etcd. So we built a lot of pl pluggability uh, into Cassandra to make it so that we, we could um, swap the Im implementation of, you know, of, 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 of where the t token metadata comes from or where the schema comes from. So those are all things that are in 4.0 because I think the, this goes back to the bigger picture that, you know, Cassandra, this is a funny old ticket from Jonathan Ellis, the founder and the main, you know, the Cassandra guy from a while ago. He wrote this ticket where he was like, you know, the, uh, Cassandra is not your database toolkit, yeah, yeah, construction kit. But actually, it makes a pretty good database construction kit. So we just kind of leaned into it. It was like, we're just going to make everything pluggable. We're going to make it so we could use the bits that, that, that we care about. Um, and, and if other bits get better over time, like, like CEP21 might, might negate the need for us to use etcd at all. So um, it kind of just gives us the freedom to use the bits of it. I think um, one question I've gotten, we've gotten a lot is like, well, is this open source? Can we use this? And it's like, I think the problem is that we took a really deep decision of like, we're going all in and cloud. You can't run this on your laptop, uh, you know, <laughs> unless you're running a kind cluster. Um, so it's like, we took a really opinionated approach to like, we're gonna build a very cloud sympathetic service that you know requires all these bits and pieces that come with the cloud for free, but if you're going to run it yourself in your own data center, it's probably better to just run Kate Sandra. So it's like, but but I do think it would be great if we get to the point where you know we we can work together with the community to come up with like maybe this is a sub project. I don't know. Maybe this is, but I but I think you know it deserves to exist um, in some way. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about repair when things are going wrong. So you were talking about um, for each each of your nodes, you're writing one copy, which is effectively unrepaired. Do you do something to collect those three copies and then write them into the repaired set? Is that exactly what you do? Compaction. Doing? Just general compaction? Yeah, actually compaction. Since since we're using the the U UCS strategy, it's sharded by token range. So, and since they flush at the same time, they're all in level zero. So the compactor groups them together into the, into compaction. Okay. Um, but, the, but for multi-region clusters, we do support multi-region. We, we do have a, a separate repair service that, um, that does Merkle tree uh, repair across regions. So we have like, we also have hints for multi-region um, in, a, in a service, like as its own service. So, so smashing the monolith allows us to kind of build you know the, the the bits that make sense for the piece, but the great thing is it doesn't affect our our, our G, GC profile. You don't have these uh, competing allocation workloads running at the same time, um, and it allows you to sort of strip out the the garbage, pun intended, um, and get to like just a you know a b built for purpose services that just do one thing well. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're out of time. Out of time. All right, thank you.